It's a hard job sharing the stage with Charlie Mulgrew the other month and now Johan Mialbe. But here he is, please put your hands together for the one and only Johan Mialbe! Thank you, Davey. We are going to be... We've got a Swedish fan here in the audience. Look at this. Can everybody see over here? I didn't want to block your view, the main attraction. <laughs> we have got 45 minutes of chat with Johan. We'll have a wee break, and then it's over to you. So anything I don't ask, you will have the opportunity to ask Johan me. I'll be in the second half. The way we do it, just in case you've had a few share bits by then, I'm not going to put the mic into the audience in case I don't get it back. <laughs> so uh, you can tweet it at Paul John Dykes or you can write it down the old-fashioned way, go over and see Shelley and Abby and uh, we'll have a look through those questions. And a selection of them will be asked in the second half. And uh, up here we've got the footage of the treble winning side. What a team! <laughs> Under Martin O'Neill. Superb. Can we just put the, the big picture of Mialbi on the wall there? Just so I can gaze at him, even when I look over there. <laughs> Johan, welcome back. Welcome back. You've flown in from Sweden and you're part of a great team, both of, as a player and then obviously with your time with Neil Lennon um, as part of the coaching staff. We're going to be talking all about it. Tell me, let's go back to um, signing. Can anybody remember this man's debut? 5-1, right. So you come in the day before that game, is that right? How did you hear about Celtic's interest? Okay, oh, you can hear me. Bear with me, you know, my English is a wee bit rusty. Um, <laughs> I, I've not been in Scotland for like uh, a bit more than a year, so I'm going to get there, you know, anyway, my English. So just tell me if you can't uh, understand me. No, uh, listen, uh, at the time, uh, we were winning the league with my childhood club, AIK Sweden, uh, and... Uh, Obviously, by uh, by scoring the goal against England as well, you know, with with Sweden. Uh, I know that was brilliant. <laughs> Great header, David Seaman. He was shit scared, you know. <laughs> uh, no, seriously. Um, so by September, this was this game was the second of September. So so by then, obviously. Um, I started to hear some rumors. I knew, in a way, this sounds a wee bit cocky, but I knew I was 27, so quite experienced in a way, uh, because I had a lot of injuries in my in my, in, in my uh, 20s, you know, uh, which stopped my career a wee bit in Sweden. But uh, by the time I was 27, uh, so I knew it was a couple of actually English clubs, and then Celtic was in the mix. I think it was a Swiss club as well, you know, but uh, who cares? Uh, <laughs> no disrespect. Uh, to Switzerland. Uh, but anyway, um, so obviously uh, it wasn't me, obviously, that was uh, having the, the contact with the clubs. You know how it is as agents. Even even if I didn't have an agent until I was 25, actually. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't that really... Uh, it wasn't something you had, you know, if you weren't a mega, mega uh, star when you were, you know, like in, in your... when you were 18 or 19 or 20 years old already. But... Anyway, um, Henrik actually, by playing with him, uh, because I played my first cap for Sweden in uh, 1997 and I started to play regularly with, with, with uh, Henrik, you know, in 98, uh, Sweden. Uh, and obviously I knew he was doing well. Uh, he wasn't the king of kings already for me that back then. Uh, he had to show it, you know, obviously over the years. Uh, but he was, you know, he was doing well for Sweden, and uh, he was selling the club in a brilliant way. Um, because back then I didn't really know that much about Celtic, except obviously, I mean, uh, a club with, you know, uh, fantastic supporters, a massive club that maybe in a way, don't get me wrong, it's too big for its country, football-wise, you know, because of the tradition and, and the, the history and the trophies, you know, Lisbon Lions and all that. Um, so, uh, so I was still thinking about maybe I should go to the Premier League, but 
because it was two clubs, you know, they weren't that great. They were probably like, you know, uh, not, no, <laughs> they were certainly not in the top 10, you know, so, uh, so I wasn't really that interested in it because Celtic sold the club that, you know, um, you're going you're gonna to have a chance to play in front of the, you know, probably best supporters in the world. It's always going to be a full house. Uh, you're going to have a chance to uh, play in Europe each year, you know, which obviously I hadn't been abroad, you know, myself back then. So, so obviously that was something that was on my list, you know, that was important to have the chance to play in either Champions League or, or obviously back then it was the UEFA Cup. Uh, and uh, then obviously to play in a club that had a chance obviously to, to, to pl get a lot of game time as well to keep my place in the Sweden squad, you know. So them things were really important to me and Henrik sold it to me. So uh, I came on a Thursday. Uh, the game obviously, the 5-1 game was on a Saturday. Uh, and this is the true story. Uh, on the Thursday, I fly in. Uh, you obviously have an agent uh, and uh, Celtic take care of me. They drive me to different, you know, I wouldn't say hospitals, but you know, I just have to do uh, a lot of different medical stuff. You know, I have to show that I'm fit enough. And uh, they were a wee bit worried, you know, because in 1992, I had a cruciate ligament injury. So I probably had the screw still in there, you know. Uh, so, so obviously Celtic were a bit, hmm, we're not going to be sure, too sure. Uh, but uh, everything went well. Uh, and really, really late on, because Fergus McCann was obviously uh, at the helm of the club. And he was a fucking bastard to negotiate <laughs> with. <laughs> uh, absolutely. It was so difficult to negotiate with. But brilliant for the club. Absolutely. I mean, in a way, obviously, in a way, he saved the club. Because I didn't know that this until, you know, uh, you know years after I signed that, obviously, the Celtic had, uh, you know, were in mega, mega problems, you know, a couple of years a couple of years, you know, before that. So, fantastic. But it was really difficult for me, anyway, uh, to get my contract over the line. It happened, uh, and later on, all the players that signed, uh, we stayed in a hotel named in near, close to East Kil Kilbride, Stakis. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's still there, you know. Uh, but anyway, Friday morning, Henry comes and picks me up in his car, you know. And, and when you drive from Starkis or East Kilbride down to Celtic Park, you know, you, can, you get a view over the hills, you know, you can look down. And, and obviously, I'm, you know, oh, this is going to be great, you know, because it was great to obviously come in and, and train and, and um, you know, meet all my, my new teammates and, and get it mm. sorted, you know, to, to, to get the feeling of... Uh, uh, of the dressing room and all that, uh, and obviously training. So I didn't think about the game, you know. I didn't think I was going to even, you know, be involved. You know, I thought I was going to just to train on the Friday, get the flight back, you know, pack, you know, a bit more clothes and, and bags and so on, and come back, you know, and 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 start my Celtic career. Uh, but Friday morning, driving down, and you know, Celtic Park didn't look how it looks now. I mean. Listen, I love the place. I love the club. But it was a dump around it. <laughs> it was a dump. It was <laughs> Anybody I, I, I didn't know. I didn't know. You know, I thought, I, I saw this big, nice stadium. I thought, when we arrived, we were really close to it. I thought, what is this around? You know, it was, it was a wee bit like Beirut, actually, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, so I didn't know what to think, you know. But... It didn't matter, you know, because obviously it's all about getting into Celtic Park, you know, in the dressing room. And it's, uh, I, I actually loved the old ways that we had, you know, that we had to always use the dressing room at Celtic Park, jump in the cars and drive to Barrowfield, you know, instead of uh, uh, being up at Lennox Town. Obviously, fantastic training facilities, you know, it's modern and all that. But, but and people are asking me today, you know, how was it to not have, you know, you only have, first we only had one grass piece at Barrowfield. Then, a couple of years later on, it was free, I think, in the end, and then an AstroTurk pitch as well, you know. But we were used to it. It doesn't matter you know, if you have the great, if you have the right characters, the right spirit. Obviously, the, the, I mean, the right mentality, and, and then it doesn't matter if you train on a cow field. Actually, I'm telling you. Uh, but anyway, on the Friday, we we finished training. 
and how it was back then, you know, obviously it was Josef Wengler, also Eric Black, I don't know who decided, you know, you could see the squad list, you know, after training, uh, and uh, this was Friday. And obviously on the way up to, to having lunch, uh, I saw my name was in the, I think it was a 20 men squ squad, something like that, 20 players in the squad. And I said, oh, I was shafted a bit, so obviously, you know, uh, but still yeah, I thought I was going to be probably in the, you know, in the stand, you know, just getting an experience of how, how Celtic play and how it is, you know, to how in this mega game old firm, you know, because I didn't know that much about the, the old firm, you know, uh, the game in itself. But uh, I'm in the squad, just phone home and say, no, I'm not going to come back tonight. Uh, I'm going to be involved in the squad, you know, I'm going to at, at least get a wee bit, wee feeling of uh, this mega game, the club and all that, you know. We're going to, uh, I can't remember the hotel, it was out there, towards Loch Lomond, Cameron House. Cameron House was a place where we always stayed uh, before games. So uh, Saturday uh, is coming up. You wake up, you have breakfast, then we go for a walk, all of us, you know, and uh, at 12 o'clock, roughly lunchtime, the starting 11 comes up. And my fucking name is in there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, I didn't know anything more or less because also light uh, the Friday uh, Friday was a very light training. So the first thing I had to do was obviously go up to Eric Black and ask, who am I going to obviously come up against? You know, which uh, what kind of uh, strikers are they? Are they obviously turning to the left or the right and you know stuff like that? You know, and obviously get a few clips. You know, uh, um, I even back then we actually had to, you know like. Small clips or video clips, you know, where you can obviously get, you know, the the, the feeling of the opponent you're going to face, you know. And, and for me, that was quite important, you know, because I thought I was signed as a midfielder as well, you know. So I was <laughs> centre half. So, but, but don't get me wrong. I I, uh, I started my career as a centre half, and you know, looking back, it was the way Celtic play, you know, uh, having so much of the ball, being so attack minded. It, it was. L good for me that I became a centre half, you know, otherwise I wouldn't think I'd been, I'd be, uh, I wouldn't have lasted a long time there. But, uh, yeah, uh, what can I say? Uh, I mean, you go out there and uh, I was obviously starting to get a wee bit you know, nervous, you know, uh, because uh, I was realising I was going to go out and play the biggest game of my career. Um, and I was a wee bit cocky, like I said, 27 years old, had played, uh, you know, uh, uh, quite a lot of Stockholm derbies, which you can't compare with the old firm, but still, still like full house, 35, 40,000, and, and obviously a big rivalry. Uh, so, so I didn't know what to expect, you know, but uh, I'm telling you, you know, that when we go out there, the packed Celtic Park, it's old firm, the atmosphere, electric, I was, and we did the hard and I thought, what the f is this? <laughs> I was shitting my pants, you know. The first 10 minutes, the first 10 minutes, I didn't want a ball. I was just, you know, just hiding, hiding, you know, until oh, I got into the game. But what, what a game that was, uh, you know, uh, with Lubo scoring two, you know, and then and, and mm -hmm. uh, really a perfect game, and, and the scoreline was just brilliant, 5-1, um, yeah. Uh, you can't get a better start, and, and uh, obviously it's still today not up there as the biggest memory or best memory, because for me, sport and football has always been about winning titles and trophies. So, uh, uh, but still, wow, uh, uh, fantastic debut. Certainly was, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> A couple of things you've said there, Johan, about being aware of the Celtic support and then the atmosphere in that game. Um, I don't know how many people in the room will share this view, but at this moment in time, uh, there is a, a couple of ultra fan groups who are locked out of Celtic Park by the board. Uh, what's your take on that? How big are they, uh, both as a player and as a, a member of the management team, Johan? How, for me, how much of a loss is it that they're not in the stadium right now? <laughs> With my experience, massive. It's a massive loss because uh, even a team like Celtic, you know, especially uh, counting in that you're going to play a lot of European games, you know, you go into, even if you have 
we always expect Celtic to win, you know, most league games. And and but there will be a few games when you know uh, the core or the best players of of the squad are going to be either injured or fatigued. And then you're going to have a few. You're going to have a wee bit of a rotation. You know, uh, I can understand what Brendan goes for. But you're going to have a wee bit of a rotation in, in in the team. And you expect obviously for us on the outside, we expect the team to yes play the same way and everything's going to function 100%, but it doesn't really work that way because, I mean, we all know that you have seven, eight players that are always in the starting level if the, you know, if the manager can pick, uh, pick his right best team, you know, and, and uh, they will not always, it's impossible for, for them to be 100% each and every game. There will be a bit uh, loss of form, you know, now and then, you know, and uh, so, where were we? I just forgot where we were. The Green Brigade. <laughs> no, the Green Brigade. So, what I mean by that, you know, uh, it's important they can get an extra push, and you get that by Green Brigade and, and the supporters, you know. Uh, for me, you know, I was lucky enough to always play in front. I think the worst crowd we had in a league game was 56,900, uh, which, I mean, I, I was spoiled because the support was just unbelievable but at the same time you have to earn you I mean you, you have to earn you the supporters trust as well to understand that you you play for Celtic and if you play for Celtic you're there to win and sometimes the game plan even the tactics from the the, the manager is not going to be right you know and it's going to rain sideways you know and and the, your, your form you're going to be shy to yourself you know <laughs> you have to find ways to win that's what it's all about, you know, uh, representing Celtic. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> you mentioned uh, a player, Lubomir Moravchik, and um, when you look at Joseph Wenglo's signing um, record, Johan Mialbe, Lubo, Marco Viduka, Vida Reseth, and Scott Marshall. And um, <laughs> it was decent. It was decent. <laughs> And, you know, he wasn't here long, was he, Joseph Venglos? Tell us a wee bit about him as a manager, because anyone I've ever spoken to had the, the highest praise and respect for Joseph Venglos, uh, Johan. Uh, yeah, I loved him to bits, you know. I didn't, I, I, obviously, I didn't have much time with him, you know, as a manager, uh, because, like you said, you know, I signed in November, and uh, he didn't survive that season, so he obviously left the club in, in, in May. Uh, but for me, he's just a true gentleman. One of the nicest uh, persons I've ever met in, in sport and football. And really clever, you know. Uh, I think, you know, we met him, you know, um, quite often after, uh, after Champions League games, you know, because obviously he was representing uh, uh, UEFA. And, and, uh, and it was not only Celtic games, sometimes after uh, national, you know, when you represented Sweden and so on. And, and played big, uh, uh, big games, you know, for the for your country. Uh, you met him, you know, so he was really respected from everyone. <sighs> but what can you say? You know, he signed Lubo, and Lubo was just uh, one of the most gifted players I've ever, ever trained and played with. You know, I was just the first time I saw him. I couldn't believe, you know, you know, he just used his left foot, right foot, you know, everything in the top corner. Sometimes when he got lazy, he didn't want to play, uh, obviously, in, in the free roll midfield. He has dropped back to, when he didn't want to run, he dropped, dropped back into left, in a left back role, you know, just chilling, you know, and no one could take the ball off him, you know. He, he was just a, a superb, superb magician and, and a footballer, you know, and, and obviously, uh, we have to thank Josef Wenglos, all of us, not only me, you guys as well, you know, had a chance to see him because he wouldn't have been here because if Joseph didn't sign him. You've also mentioned um, a certain Henrik Larsson, and it's great to know that he was uh, obviously selling the club to you, Johan. Every time I speak to someone who played with him, I always try and figure out what did he do differently, you know, in terms of preparation uh, on the training ground. Uh, what made him the King of Kings? Because we've seen him as a Celtic fan, we've seen him developing from a player who was always a good player, but what he became was sensational. Yeah, I saw that as well, you know, because obviously, you know, he didn't have the best of times at, uh, at Feyenoord, you know, before he signed uh, uh, for Celtic. Um, but 
if I look back at his career and why he, uh, to me, is the best player I've ever played with, um, it's because not because of all his goals. It's not because he was, you know, brilliant in the, in, you know, in the box or, or or heading the ball so well. It is because he was leading our line. You know, he was starting the defense, and he's the best striker I've ever played with uh, to be able to press an opponent, or obviously, usually there are other teams, you know, back line, you know, to one side and keep the ball there because being a center half. Or even a, even a fullback or whatever. It doesn't matter if you play back three or, or, or back four with, with two and a half. It's if a st the striker in your team can just lock one half one half of the of the of the pitch, you know straight away that where the ball is going to be. You know, and it's really easy for you to just tuck over with your team and you know, and, and you know obviously narrow the space and make sure you're going to win the second ball. He was absolutely fantastic when it comes to that. and. He was working tirelessly, you know, because I usually, as a Swede, I always get the question, who was the best striker, Henrik or Slatan? <laughs> and, <laughs> and obviously in Sweden, because Slatan won so many uh, titles, you know, in Italy and, and even in Spain, uh, uh, he's seen as, <laughs> probably because of social media as well as exploded, he's seen as obviously that he was a proper, proper world-class striker. I, I I rate Henrik so much higher than Slat. <laughs> phenomenal. That's phenomenal. And um, moving on from Dr. Joe, we uh, appointed John Barnes, and it was a, the John Barnes and <laughs> Kenny Dalglish dream team, Johan. We'll get to the good bits with Martin O'Neill, don't worry. <laughs> I mean, again, speaking to people who played under... John Barnes, have given me a, a view on why it didn't go well. What, what was your take on it? Yeah, well, I'm here to be honest. Am I not? Uh, no, uh, for me, the problem was, um, first of all, John Barnes, he was a superb footballer. Uh, he was magnificent playing for Liverpool. And, and, and you know, uh, but... I do think it was a bit of a surprise that a guy who has had never coached or managed at all, I don't, th I don't think even an under-21 team, suddenly were the manager of Celtic. Even, you know, regardless of his fantastic uh, CV as, as a player, you know, uh, it is, uh, you know, it's not right. And he... <laughs> The problem for me was as well, you know, he had this impression that he came in and said that Newcastle is a big football club in Celtic. And even I, you know, only being there for like six, seven months, you know, even I, as a foreigner as well, you know, said, what? The He's barking up the wrong tree here. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you can never say that Newcastle is a big club in Celtic. So there was this arrogance to a certain degree. You know, I can understand it's difficult to be a manager, you know, sometimes. And I, I understand that he wanted us, uh, this Celtic side, that he was going to build, John Barnes, was going to play like his fantastic Liverpool side, 4-2-2-2. Two, two, two. Yeah, sh check the players first, you know. Do you have the same kind of talent and obviously the same quality as the, that Liverpool side? No, probably not. Uh, so that was a, that was you know a bummer straight away you know I, in the end you know I I I, I, I didn't mind John Barnes uh, as a person uh, but I didn't think uh, you know personally I didn't think he was you know good enough as a manager he wasn't experienced enough to to be the manager of Celtic and and obviously it's easy to 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 agree now in hindsight you know but that's like you know why kick uh, on someone that's lying down. Uh, but we all know the results weren't good enough. Then you get the sack. And I didn't mind it, you know, because even if I uh, didn't have a problem with John as a manager, you know, he, he wanted to build his own uh, team, which was fine. Uh, it's his, it was his pr prerogative. But obviously, I didn't play that much. I was quite much in a lot of bands. So, so I was a bit lucky because I was on my way thinking about it because I was really afraid of losing my Sweden place, you know. The, uh, in Sweden, because back then I hadn't played a, a big uh, championship for Sweden, so 
so I was starting to think about obviously trying to get go on loan or, or get another club, you know. So personally, I didn't mind, you know, obviously what happened. But it, you should never say that because I respect him what he has done on the football pitch with magnificence. I just think he was too inexperienced to be the manager of Celtic. I agree, hundred percent. Just before we go on, and we will talk about Neil Lennon. Did, was it the Swedish boys that introduced Lenny to snooze, Johan? Was it you and Henrik? Are you to blame? Of course he blames me. He, he blamed me for a lot of things. Uh, I can't, you know, I remember when he cut this... Uh, he, he was actually... Uh, we won... Uh, we actually won a few trophies during our time uh, as a players. Uh, and, uh, you know, we had a really, really tough celebration night uh, after one of them. Um, must have, must have been, uh, yeah, it was, was probably after um, uh, securing the treble, you know, and, and obviously uh, we had a, a few too many brandies and, and uh, Neil, he, he obviously, he, he, fell on, he fell down and, and cut his <laughs> eyebrow and, you know, and the next day he was, you know, he obviously, that was my fault as well, you know, because he had, you know, a couple of too many brandies, you know, because we shared a brandy, come on. Uh, no, but with the snooze thing, you know, which is something you shouldn't use, you know, that is, that is a Swedish thing, you know, it's, it is nicotine, uh, it's very, very popular in Sweden, and it's something that uh, got, got very common in the 70s for footballers and ice hockey, which ice hockey is quite popular in Sweden as well, you know, and, and uh, it's, uh, it just calms you down a wee bit. You know, but unfortunately, um, Neil is a quite of an addictive person. <laughs> oh, fantastic guy, but a, a bit of an addictive person. So, so obviously, uh, he's blaming me for introducing him to snooze. And that's why you always see him. I don't know if you always do, na do nowadays, but with the, obviously the snooze. <laughs> Uh, underneath his lip, but it's uh, it's nicotine and it's common in Sweden. It shouldn't be used anywhere else in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Henrik and Johan. I do. <laughs> of course, uh, we did win the league cup uh, under Kenny Dalglish, but the man who was up on that video before he came on the stage, Martin O'Neill, as a Celtic supporter, he changed everything. Johan, he changed absolutely everything. Um, you know, up until his tenure, Celtic didn't win trebles. You know, we had to go back to the 60s when Jock Steen did it twice. And he came in, and I felt that he was very humble on the steps of Celtic Park. Um, and it took him a wee while. He has said uh, in interviews before he realised what your best position was. Um, how did that materialise between you and Martin? The gaffer, yeah. He's the only one I call the gaffer. I actually spoke to him two months ago, you know. He wanted help from me for once. Uh, no, uh, Martin is um, the only one I probably would have been able to run through a brick fall for. Um, he changed my <laughs> Celtic career um, in a way. Uh, I know he wasn't too sure. Uh, back then, uh, Mark Reaper was still at the club. He was obviously having a, a serious toe problem and couldn't play. So it was actually him whispering to, 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 to the gaffer that, uh, you know, he's a son half, Mjalby. You, you shouldn't look at him as a midfielder. Thank God. <laughs> uh, because obviously, you know, uh, you know, it was important for when the gaffer come, came in, you, we all knew the one that he would keep that, um, you know, the likes of obviously Henrik and, and Stelian. Uh, myself was lucky enough to be involved, you know, uh, later on, um, that the, the new, the new uh, gaffer, the new manager would obviously uh, try to obviously sign a few, you know, a few players, which he did. Fantastic players. You know, uh, Chris Sutton, Alan Thompson, uh, Neil Lennon, uh, John Hartson. Uh, have I missed a few? Uh, yeah, I've probably missed a few. Jos Falharen. <laughs> Bobo Balde. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, did he? Did he? Yeah, did he? Of course, you know. <laughs> he was so quick, you know. I couldn't even tell his name. <laughs> yeah, but uh, no. So it was important, obviously, to to uh, you know show your best form and that obviously you had qualities, you know, to to uh, be a part of uh, this new team that uh, Martin Lee was going to build, and and uh, we knew straight away, obviously, that 
he was maybe a bit different than other managers in the way that he was more interested, obviously in quality, but in characters. I mean, the name I just mentioned, most of them, they were mega big characters in the dressing room and on the pitch. And, and uh, they really helped us build this uh, winning mentality and this, you know, it was usually, you know, most of the training sessions, they were, when we played against each other, they were sometimes harder than obviously playing games, the league games, because, you know, the mentality we had, it was, I wouldn't say it was fist fights, but it was, you know, like mini wars, you know, I mean, you didn't want to lose in training, you know, not at all. Sorry? A wee bit. I wouldn't say that th th these guys, they, they obviously, listen, I love watching this Celtic side, but they wouldn't have a stand a chance physically. <laughs> physically, I'm talking about. Not, but physically. No. No. So, uh, uh, but I agree with you that uh, that Celtic made Martin O'Neill the gaffer, the manager of, uh, of Celtic Football Club, uh, was a savior because he turned everything around by his cleverness, by the person he is. He's very intelligent, uh, and, and by the way he installed, you know, uh, this winning mentality, this understanding that take on the pressure of being a Celtic player. Because it's, you know, it's not always great days, you know. You know, it doesn't matter, you know, yeah, you win most games, but sometimes you have, a, you know, your, yourself, you know, personally, and not in the best form, you know, you had a few really, really poor games. Then you have to take it on that, you know, some supporters are gonna boo at you, or just get, tell you, fucking yeah, we go home. Or take it, <laughs> come on. Because, you know, we've had a, a lot of really talented, good players, you know, at Celtic when I was there, you know, they couldn't cut it. They couldn't, they couldn't handle the pressure that you have to win every game. Otherwise, it's the World War Three. in a way, you know. I, I'm taking it a wee bit too far here, but you know where I'm coming at anyway. Yeah, and, and for me, you know, I know now, obviously being very old and lived through a lot, that that doesn't matter what comes out of me. I, I've got a really, really uh, strong mentality. I'm very strong mentally. I know, and playing for Celtic really helped me, being able to do that. So whatever I do in the rest of my life, I know that you just come at me. I'm going to sort it out. You know, I, I can't overstate enough the impact that Mark O'Neill on this football club. And obviously, he was appointed 23 years ago. And I'm just trying to calculate in my mind how many titles have we won in that 23 years? I'm going to say 17. No. No. 19. 19. We've lost two on the last day. They won three in a row. And then they won one under Slippy Stevie. Aye, right. So I would say 17 and 23, right? Take 23 years before Martin O'Neill, how many league titles did Celtic win? Half a dozen. Right, that that is the culture, the mentality that Johan's talking about. Exactly, so did I, so did I. They were amazing, and the, the reason I'm saying it is, Martin O'Neill talks about you in, in his book. I don't know if you've read the book, Johan. He also mentions a, a certain Jim Crockwell. Is he in the audience? He should be. He normally is. Um, but the reason I'm bringing Jim up, Jim continually supports our charity endeavours by giving us um, items, signed items that we can raise money for good causes. And we've done it all weekend. We're raising money for wee Jamie Tierney. Uh, so thanks, everybody, for chipping in. We've raised about nine or ten grand for the wee guy. So thanks, every single... And by the way, it's not about money, money, money. If you can share the word, you can retweet and, and share and all that kind of stuff. That's great. There's a the man there, Jim Crockwell. Thanks very much, Jim. Now, we win the treble, uh, Johan. I've got to say, in all my Celtic support in life, that era, that manager was the one that I actually felt we could do something in Europe. And of course, it did happen. Uh, and what a run it was. You know how humble this man is? He didn't want to take this uh, onto the stage today because he never won it. He said, I can't do it, I never won that. 
Um, but Seville, who was there? Right. People tell me you don't celebrate defeat, but Seville for me will be the only opportunity to see my football team in a European final in my lifetime, I'm guessing. And this man was part of that team. There's a picture of you, Johan, on your arse after the game. <laughs> Gutted. Gutted. And you were that away, that away from winning it. Talk us through that run. You were making me cry. I was just thinking, fuck <laughs> me. Uh, I, sti I still haven't watched the game, and I never will. It's the, uh, it's the biggest disappointment in my footballing career. No, in my career, uh, uh, in my life, I would say. Um, because like I started this, uh, not interview, but I started this Q&A and, and, you know, and I said it's, it's all about winning trophies in the end. That's why I've been competing in sport and I was lucky enough to have a chance to be a minimal, you know, um, part of the, the fantastic Celtic history. Uh, and I was winning trophies. And we knew, running up to the, obviously, to this game, to this mega final, that... <sighs> Probably it was our last chance to win a European trophy because you know if, if you looked at the average age of the, of the, the squad and the team was you know like 29, 30 and more or less, uh, and uh, um, <sighs> fuck. <laughs> no, it's it's horrible, you know, because we we blew it and and um, and and <laughs> no, we blew it because we did really well. And, and we should have done better in the Champions League, you know, with the team we had, you know. We couldn't really get this winning formula away from home because we were beating most homes, uh, most teams uh, at home, you know. But away from home was really difficult for us. <sighs> this final, we felt we had a really good chance, obviously. Not, not being arrogant or cocky. We felt we, 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 we had a really good chance to win uh, this final. We started off badly, you know, and... and uh, and couldn't get into the game, but, uh, but then obviously Henrik scored the equalizer, and then we were back in, and he was fantastic, by the way, and then obviously scored another equalizer. But then it was extra time, and that, that was the time where we f I felt we were strong in Porto. We had them, we had them, but obviously, unfortunately, Bubu got sent off as well, you know, it didn't help. It's not his fault, but it didn't help, you know, uh, and, and uh, Unfortunately, obviously, the, the, this, this score is, you know, winning goal. And, you know, uh, for me personally, <sighs> sometimes you get a wee bit dramatic. But, uh, you know, uh, and even if I had really, really small children back then, you know, it's, that was, you know, more important than life, that final, you know. Uh, so that's probably that picture when I'm just, I just wanted to have a spade and just dig the biggest hole ever in that's on that pitch and just go down there and just, you know, hide away. That's how it is, you know, uh, 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 because, you know, we knew, we knew we, that we wouldn't have another chance to win a European trophy. And we could have become, uh, become legends, you know, winning this time. <laughs> no, but thanks. Fast forward a wee bit, there's gonna be questions you want to ask. I've not mentioned front page of the Daily Record yet, so you might want to ask that. Um, fast forward a few years, Johan, and your pal, Neil Lennon, as you said, gets the job at Celtic. Um, I didn't realise you were as tight as that, you know, as players. And had you kept in touch after leaving Celtic? Uh, yes, we had. Um, but more from a, a coaching uh, standpoint, um, we, were, we were quite close as players uh, because we loved to... Have a wee dig at each other. We <laughs> argued every single game, more or less, you know. Because obviously, I wanted him to be in the right position to shield us, you know, not being able to play through the midfield and all that. And then obviously, if, if I misplaced the pass or uh, Bobo wasn't on his toes, which was seldom, but it happened, you know. Then obviously, Lenny, he had to dig at me, you know, because he saw me as the leader in the back three, you know. So. He said, you fucking keep doing control and all that, you know. And you know how Lenny is. 
passionate, but uh, brilliant. Yeah, no, but we were quite close, but obviously not, you know, maybe not that tight that we were socializing that much, you know, uh, outside the football pitch. Uh, but uh, we, we were obviously, uh, he was phoning me now and then, you know, and I obviously I was following him uh, going through the ranks here at Celtic, you know, obviously getting the, the under 21 job and so on. And, and he, he was obviously phoning me now and then because he liked, uh, <sighs> Uh, this is actually his words, so I don't know if it's true or not. He might have just fooled me, but he, no, he liked my character. He liked the way I, I you know, uh, that, that is what I stand for, you know. And and uh, he wanted me, obviously, uh, if he ever got the job. He wasn't even thinking about Celtic then, you know, that he maybe got the, you know, job in the Championship or whatever, you know, maybe in the in, in the first division in Scotland. And if I was interested to to um, come with him, and I said yes, 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 you know. Just keep me posted, you know, and, and so on. And uh, then it happens um, that he phones me. I can't remember the exact date, but obviously it's March 2010. Uh, is it March? Tony Mowbray have yeah get the sack. Saint Mirren. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So so I'm actually the true story is uh, I had I can't remember what I was doing, but uh, I was in my house. Uh, I was actually in the bathroom. No, 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 but I was in the bathroom. <laughs> and, and Neil Anna phones me. And obviously, I wasn't stupid enough because I was always, you know, looking out to, you know, how, how Celtic was faring and uh, how we were doing and, you know, and uh, usually watching most of the games. So, so I knew that uh, Tony Mowbray was, you know, in some trouble, you know, because the results weren't good enough. Uh, but obviously, I, maybe I didn't expect that Neil Anna uh, would obviously get the chance to obviously prove himself. He phones me anyway, and you know what he says to me? He tells me, Johan, you know, I've, I've just got the job, you know, it's only going to be for three months, you know, but it's a good chance for us, you know, to just, you know, obviously get some experience, and obviously the highest level, and, and so on, and, and uh, say, you got one minute to decide. I say, fucking one minute? I'm not speaking <laughs> to you for five months. <laughs> so, so I had a minute to decide, you know, to come over, so. Yeah, I did, you know, and obviously uh, the rest is history in a way that uh, we did well enough to get the chance to build our team, uh, which was, you know, fantastic in a way. But, I'm, you know, in a way for my coaching career, it was the wrong move because I didn't have, you know, great experience. Um, but obviously, so I had to use obviously all my mental skills in a way to understand. But I knew the club, obviously. Uh, had been there for six years beforehand as a club, not as much, obviously not, not as well as L Lenny, you know. But he he was the ma manager anyway. So we knew we got three months, you know. Pistol Pete to, uh, told us Pistol more or Pete. less, <laughs> you have to win every game, you know. If you don't win every game here in the league, you know, and uh, you're gonna, it's not gonna be a very, very no chance you're gonna get the job. So. But with us, uh, we, we do, and obviously we win the, this important Old Farm game, um, the, the end of the old, uh, old Farm games of the season, and, and we have a chance. But then we lose to Inverness, that was horrific. Uh, in the semi-final of the, the Scottish Cup, uh, if I... Uh, yeah. So uh, we didn't think, actually, we didn't, we, we, I, I don't think we ever thought we would get a chance, obviously, to, to uh, be involved as in management, but uh, yeah, lucky, uh, lucky enough uh, for us too, you know, uh, we had a chance um, to do it. And it, it's obviously, it was a luxury, you know, to obviously create facilities, you know, having the chance to uh, work for the club you love. The, the, for me, I've learned to love uh, with the best supporters in the world. Uh, uh, you know, and you had the chance to, to work with, you know, just top class footballers, you know, uh, and. So, so it was magnificent. I, I just felt, you know, because obviously the implosion of Rangers and all that, um, that it was, yeah, I can't remember. What's the name of the club now? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it started to get a wee bit too easy. We, we all knew that we would win the league. So the only thing we didn't like that we were actually starting to build quite a good team in... Europe, we were doing quite well in Champions League, and, and we were actually signing, you know, very, very good players for a low cost, not much money. 
and selling them on, you know, we weren't selling them on when we had them, you know, but obviously years after you can see that Celtics sold them on for a lot of money. It's fantastic, but <sighs> maybe we were stupid because we were working for the best club, in, you know, in the world, in a way. Not the best, maybe footballing wise, but you know what I'm talking about. But uh, uh, but Phil, uh, we felt that we wouldn't get any money to improve uh, the club in Europe. And back then, it started to be really, you know, uh, quite important for uh, Neil, myself, uh, Gary, Alan, uh, that because we were obviously getting in. Uh, getting through actually the, the, the group phase in Champions League would have meant that maybe we can build something better, you know, because we probably knew that we would win the league, you know. Um, so we obviously decided to to end our... Uh, walk away. Yeah, to walk away. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously uh, career-wise, for me personally, it was absolutely the worst thing I've ever done because I moved back to Sweden and I had to have you know, all the balls in my own car and I had had to work with clubs that were, you know, it was was just m minging, <laughs> minging. <laughs> you, you mentioned, but I just look, I, I look back uh, with with just fond memories, you know, uh, especially the the obviously the win against Barcelona and all that, just incredible, you know, and it wasn't just, you know. It was fantastic. You know, when you're a footballer, you're so focused on obviously the uh, the match plan and obviously the tactics that the, the manager has given you, and so sometimes you're actually able to just shut off your ears a wee bit, you know. Which is, you know, strange to say, you know, in front of a you know full house, you know, in a European night at Celtic Park, you know, the atmosphere is just. Oh. But now, obviously, when I was assistant manager, yes, I was still focused on what I was going to do, but. Uh, then you just you you could just stand there and just see the atmosphere and feel the atmosphere and you can kick every ball. So, so um, their memories are just untrue and and, and fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> Johan obviously regretted uh, leaving when he did. There's a couple of things I want to ask you about your your time as uh, part of Neil Lennon's management team, Johan. Everything else will be asked by you guys in the second half. The first one is you mentioned Pistol Pete. Um, and I'm thinking about transfers. So see when you look at Charlie Mulgrew, for example, here's a player that played with Celtic when he was a young boy. He's been playing in Scottish football. He's obviously uh, well known to the club. And you think, well, who signed him? Probably Neil Lennon, but who knows? And then you get guys like Izzy Giri, uh, Berem Kayal, Efran Juarez, Victor Wanyama, Virgil van Dijk, from all over the globe. So how, how does... How do Celtic identify players, and how much say does a manager have, you Johan? Uh, I would say, I don't know how it is today, but uh, for, you know, Brendan or how it was for Ant. Uh, uh, but Neil had actually quite a big say uh, when it came to the... to uh, put in the final word. Uh, how it normally worked back then, uh, it, I mean, it was still in a really good scouting, uh, you know, department. And John Parks was uh, at the helm of it. Uh, and he did really well, you know, obviously finding this place. But usually, you know, if Neil and ourselves uh, had before a season or before a transfer window, you ask for, his, let's say, we'd be looking for left back, you know, uh, that position. Uh, uh, and then obviously, they, I mean, they look, I mean, the scouting department, they look through probably like 100 left backs, or whatever, you know. Uh, it can be maybe 60, 70, or whatever. And then you obviously you find five. And then usually that was probably the time when Neil Lennon got involved. Uh, when the manager got involved, you know, in the, because right, count of five, who was probably the most interested of the left backs? And, uh, uh, and obviously looking through all the skills and the way this left back plays the games. Uh, uh, and then, yeah, um, I wouldn't say all the, the signings would have been that way, but you know, most of the signings, when I was there, my experience is that Neil Lennon had a, you know, the, at least a really good chance to have the final say. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, I was looking at the Virgil van Dijk thing. Um, and the Virgil van Dijk thing is, you know, obviously John Parks and all the scouts, they did a great job. You know, we were looking for a, a center half. Neil Lerner went to, to, to watch, uh, watch him twice. Um, 
But then obviously because he gave me a lot of uh, confidence and responsibility when it came to the center halves and the defenders, you know, uh, not only obviously to single out players, but uh, uh, tac tactically as well. So we had played our uh, one, one of the league games and uh, uh, Kroningen, where Virgin was playing, uh, was playing their last league game against Ajax away in Schroningen on a Sunday. So Neil sent me out, you know, to just tell him straight away, are we going to sign this lad or not? So uh, I fly Sunday morning to Amsterdam, jump on a train two hours to Schroningen. It's Schroningen Ajax. Ajax has already won the league. And after five minutes, this big lump is making a mistake. It's one nil Ajax. Rest of the uh, rest of the half, he was doing quite fine, and you could see he was a Rolls Royce. You know, he was you know, he was a bit of a big baby. I don't know what to call it, but he was <laughs> like he was. <laughs> no, but he was <laughs> far much. He was bigger, you know, uh, bigger built in a way, and and uh, but he was you could see straight away, you know, he was great on the ball, you know, and. It was like he was only playing in, you know, second gear, you know, if, if you have five gears. Never mind. Start the second half, Ajax scores second goal, 2-0. And I would probably say, and I did to, to Neil, that, um, because I had to phone him straight after the game, that nah, he was at fault for the, I would say, he was at fault for the second goal as well, you know. If you really are going to be, you know, hard towards him, you know. Uh, but you should sign him because this guy, he's just going to rip it up. You know, um, if you give him time. Obviously, I didn't know because then he asked him, how much is going to cost? I don't have a fucking clue. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that, that was, I was assistant manager. I didn't, I didn't know what it was supposed to cost, you know. Um, the only thing I said, you know, maybe you shouldn't go, you know, crazy anyway because, you know, he, he hasn't got any experience. He's only played for Schroningen. It is Dutch football. They all think they are best in the world, you know, regardless of position. <laughs> you know how Dutch footballs are. They all think they're best. <laughs> uh, but this kid, you know, I said, he's mega strong. He's, he's as strong as Bobo. He's as good as, um, maybe not Lobo on the ball, but fantastic on the ball. I know he's, he's got great passing range. You know, he should be fantastic in the air, you know, if we really retain him. The only thing we have to focus on is to keep him focused. Because, you know, he thinks he's Beckenbauer at the moment. <laughs> but, you know, lucky for us and for the club, we signed him, you know. And, he, you know, uh, he's still, I would say, still the, the best player I've uh, coached and trained with, anyway. Virgil van Dijk, he was superb. There's uh, some questions coming through on Twitter. I'm not just being rude here, so I'm going to have a look through them as well. And we have uh, the reason 2003 hurts so much, says Kelvin, is you all deserve to win that night. What you did win is my heart and those of everyone's in this room. Ooh, thank you very much. That was very nice. Thank you. Okay, here we go. In your opinion. In your opinion. How many current squad players are true Celtic quality? You've given us your 11, Johan, but if you're going to progress in the Champions League, how many of those 11 do you think are up to the, the standard? Do I need to reply? You, you see? <laughs> no, no. I, I would say um, three. Three. We were talking about no, this last you, week. No, you were talking yeah. about the score, not the, the starting score. eleven. I, I, can, I can pick my score, can I, with 25 guys, yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe three, four, not more. Yeah. There you go, three or four. Um, quality. Now, Chris, double denim, where are you? And he's, Are you wearing double denim? Aye, almost. <laughs> Good to see you. Uh, question for Johan. With mentality being spoken about so often now, including as part of the current Celtic team's challenges... How much is a mental discipline, focus and passion uh, in coaching and on the training field? How much is that a part of you as a coach trying to get into the, the mentality of the players? Uh, 
No, it's extremely important, I would say, from uh, especially from the manager. I mean, he's the one setting the tone. Um, obviously, I, I know football has changed. You know, I'm no, I, I'm not stupid. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm no dinosaur. Uh, I mean, today, I would say, today's players are better on the ball than we were, but mentally and physically, they are. Because of the rules, obviously, you know, I mean, you're not allowed to tackle properly today. Uh, because even if you win the game, even if you win the ball, you know, without showing studs, but I take you with me in my, obviously, in the force, then it's usually sometimes even a yellow card, but it's always a free kick against me. I can't understand that, you know, and that, that makes me a bit, you know, disappointed, you know, that you're taking, bo uh, taking away that physical element of football. When I was in the toilet earlier, somebody asked me to ask a question about um, what happened on touchline between Alan McCoyst and Neil Lennon. <laughs> Does anybody else want to ask that question? That's a silly question. I don't know the answer. I don't. <laughs> I didn't. That's what Neil Lennon said. And I've actually asked the Lennon and Neil a few times. You know, he never he never tells me. So. I think it's probably a bit, a bit nothing, really. You know, just a few words in the log, and that was, that was the end of it. Blown out of proportion, Johan. But, you know, if we extend that... Listen, door, Lenny won, because he survived, he survived longer than Ali McCoy's in the job, didn't he? He did, yeah, he did. <laughs> just on, on the subject of Neil Lennon, uh, I know things didn't end well second time round from Johan, but, you know, in your time, uh, being part of his team, he, he went through hell. You know, he attacked on the sidelines, doing his job at Tyne Castle, um, threats, bullets in the post, attacked in public. You know, he's your mate, but he's, your, he's also your colleague. Um, could you just tell us exactly you know, how serious was that and the mental strength that Neil Lennon needed to get through it as well? <laughs> I find it incredible, you know, that... that uh the way he's been, uh, obviously was treated, uh, you know, obviously getting uh, bullets in the post and all that, you know, and, 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 and still wanting to, to do the job, you know, and, and being obviously um, the Celtic talisman he was during his first tenure, you know, as a manager, and, and obviously his CV as a player, you know, because you have to remember, you know, I, I think he's been... Listen, listen. I know some some here might not uh, agree with me. Uh, I still think I think Neil Lennon is a Celtic legend, and he should be treated that way <laughs> because he was a he was a he was a great servant, uh, you know, as a player for the club. And and he, you know, knowing him, you know, he, he loves the club more than most people I've ever met. He's so passionate about Celtic. Yes. I knew, obviously, that uh, uh, what happened, you know, with being uh, the manager when, obviously, we, we didn't get the ten in a row, obviously, uh, and we failed. Uh, but still, you know, I, I felt the criticism was a wee bit too hard. Uh, and yes, you know, some of us, you know, when we did, you know, some interviews, you know, and obviously Neil didn't like that. We, we, I mean, we, I could only be honest, you know, the few times I uh, had to do, you know, and an interview with a, with a paper and, and saying that, you know, yeah, I think probably Neil has to go, you know. He didn't like it, you know. Uh, because that's the way Lanny is, you know. And uh, he, did, he didn't like, you know, when you criticize him, you know, or anything like that. But sometimes, you know, the results just, they were just proven that we weren't good enough. Uh, and then, you know, uh, at Celtic, you know, if the results are not good enough, you, you have to obviously leave, leave the job and uh, you have to go. Uh, so, but I still feel that some supporters were a wee bit too hard on the criticism of him, you know, demanding that he should leave the job. He's a manager. It's up to the guys upstairs to pull the plug. It's not Neil Lennon's job to decide that he's... Because he, why agree defeat? If you manage it, you still have to believe that you're good enough. Which most of us, you know, if you were, we are bosses for any company, you know, if, you know, we always think that we have the ability to obviously turn things around. So it's up to other guys, you know. So uh, uh, for me, Neil Lennon is a brilliant, uh, he was a brilliant player. Uh, I think he's a very passionate manager. Unfortunately, it didn't end up well the last time, but uh, he's, he should always be seen, I think, from the supporters as a legend, anyway, Celtic legend. 
<clears throat> there was a few proposals and asking if you were single and all that, Johan, but I'm sure you get that all the time. Um, you mentioned Pistol Pete earlier, and I'm going to ask you a question about Peter Lowell. I know the position he has at the club at the moment has a very specific job description. But when I heard he was coming back as a chairman, I just felt if he was at the club, then it's Peter Lowell at Celtic. It doesn't really matter what his title is. When you're part of the man management team, how, I'm guessing, um, how overbearing is he? What's the relationship like for the management team when someone as powerful behind the scenes as Peter Lowell is part of the club? <sighs> No, uh, no, I'm just thinking, you know, obviously, um, that was down to, obviously, Neil Lerner as a manager to have all the contact with Peter, you know. Uh, uh, you know, the rest of us, myself, Tom, uh, Gary Park, uh, you know, it wasn't like Peter Law was knocking our doors and asking, you know, if, you know what, what do we think about the team? You know, obviously, he spoke to the manager all the time, you know, so. And the rest of us, we were just assistants, so. Even if we knew that, e e e even if we, e even if we knew and know that we, we, we understand football better than Peter. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, not really. Um, I mean, the pressure is doesn't matter. But yeah. The, we knew that it was always going to happen anyway, you know, because obviously uh, we didn't have the most experience, uh, but we were used to the club and we were used to being in a football, a football place that we knew that we had to win every game more or less, you know. That's just part and parcel being at Celtic. If you can't handle the pressure, don't be there. Yes. Look at the man. He signed under Joe Vengloss. He suffered the John Barnes era, and then Martin O'Neill came to the club, took us to a European yeah. final. And this man here is a passionate Celtic fan. You've seen it tonight. Please raise the roof for Johan Mjölbe.